Good morning, everyone. I'm Rev. Dave Hunter, and I would like to welcome you all to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Pottstown. We gather this Sunday morning, not because we share a creed, but because we share a promise to support one another on our spiritual journeys. Our services are different each week, but the love and compassion we offer one another here remain the same. So whoever you are, wherever you come from, whomever you love, we're glad to have you with us today. And today is June 6th, D-Day, 77 years ago was the Normandy invasion. And if I remember correctly, my mother's youngest brother was part of the group Normandy on D-Day. We hope you will join us after the service for a very special coffee hour which you will hear about shortly. And this is the time for announcements. So if anyone has an announcement pertinent to UUFP, please unmute yourself and speak Hello? up. Sorry? Yeah, right behind yours. Okay. Yeah, this is you asked. Yeah, I have one. Um, we're going to be meeting in person on the 27th at uh, in the backyard, uh, in the back parking lot, I should say. Um, we're, uh, Mr. Dusky is setting up the uh, area and I'm more than willing to help. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we said we're going to establish some, some guidelines slash rules. We're kind of going by, you know, we are going by what the CDC said and, you know, maybe folks were saying, well, why aren't we meeting sooner? Well, the CDC, um, kind of threw us a curveball by opening up faster than we thought and the interior of the building is just not ready. Um, Cause we've been, anyway, it's a long story. So what we're going to do is um, assume everybody has masks. And if you don't have a mask, we're gonna ask, if you don't have a vaccine, uh, sorry, we're assuming everybody's vaccinated, but if you're not vaccinated, we're requesting you wear a mask. Even if you are vaccinated and you're a wimp, um, you can you can wear a mask if you want, and um, I, I stole this idea from what a friend of mine they did at church, and they had little red and green dots that you could wear, and a red dot meant can please don't hug me, you know, mm. and stay stay further, you know, kind of maintain your distance a little bit, and green meant you're accepting hugs, so. Uh, will have those and you can just put them on your clothes so people recognize what you're comfortable with. Because it's a very personal decision right now, how much interaction with people, even though we love everybody in the fellowship, how much you're really comfortable with at the moment. Thank you. Any other announcements? I have a question um, for Mary and the, I guess the board. Does that hold true for today that if you've been vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask? Um, of course, children will wear masks, uh, but yeah. anybody not vaccinated and anybody uncomfortable with not wearing a mask, wear a mask, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Is that hold yeah. true? I can speak to that. Um, we're uh, at least part of it. I know that uh, when you're at the food table, you should be wearing a mask. If you're serving food or preparing food at the fellowship, you should be wearing a mask. If you're, go if you're going up to get food, that's, you should wear a mask then. And we have masks. So if you end up there without a mask, then you can, we, we will provide you with one. Did I- Take off the mask when I eat? You can try. I think that would be a good idea. I think okay, good. have special masks for that. Uh, yeah. um, Linda, Kay, have I, is that, is that the extent of it or do we have other masking rules? No, I think no. you pretty much summed it up. Okay. All right, we will move on. I now invite you to take a deep breath, settle more firmly into your body, and listen to the sound of the chime.
Let us listen this morning. Let us listen to the many voices within us. But let us listen as well to the voices of our neighbors, whether they are sitting beside us or halfway around the world. And let us listen for the voice that we cannot quite hear. Is it the voice of a child in Yemen or Ethiopia or Texas? Or is it the voice of God? Perhaps they're the same voice. Now for our chalice lighting. We light this flame to remind ourselves once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community, and to each other. And Mary has lit the chalice, which I hope everybody can see. Now, Carly, it's your turn to play hymn number 10, which is Immortal Love. The verse of that, and we will listen. time in our service, we join many other Unitarian Universalist congregations in sharing from our hearts. If an event in your life stirs you this morning to joy or sorrow, hope or fear, share with us a few words. Kay will drop a stone into the water, and the water represent the love of this community gently holding us. And unmute yourself if you're going to share, please. I have a joy. Um, we had a wonderful visit with our daughter and her husband and our granddaughter, who's five years old. Yesterday, the first day of the pool opening, uh, the temperature in the pool was 65, but we all swam. And we also took a field trip to see Logan Barnhouse. And uh, everybody got to scratch the, the, he isn't a little pig, scratch him with the pig scratcher. And we just had a, a just such a wonderful day with the cookout. So I'm just so thankful for it. Thank you. I, I, I just, just now when you said, you know, we said June 6th and said it was D-Day, I'm like, oh shoot, I let the fourth go by without acknowledging that that's when the allies and my dad drove into, rolled into Rome. Um, he was not the first one in. Uh, there was always the joke that everybody was the first soldier to go into Rome on June 4th. But what he, um, you probably heard me say this before, he always said that Rome on June 4th, 1944, was the most dangerous place on, on, in the world. He said, because there were so many drunks driving tanks. Because <laughs> he said, the, as they got into town, all the pretty young ladies wanted to give them kisses and were handing them bottles of wine, which they were taking. Hey. Dave and I are so thrilled because our eldest granddaughter, Brenna, who lives in Massachusetts and is part of the, uh, up the Grafton congregation, graduated from high school yesterday and was valedictorian of her class. All right, this is John. Uh, with regard to D-Day, uh, as one who was in the older generation, my parents who lived through the war, it was not that far past when I was born, you know, always made sure I knew about D-Day. As one who reads a fair bit of military history, the uh, American army was very unskilled and really got its uh, ears boxed after the landings in North Africa, uh, had a terrible time in Italy to which Mary's referred but it was a long slog up Italy, a lot of casualties, a lot of things were done wrongly, but it was actually good because by the time they did the big landing on D-Day, things went a lot better than they would have if not for the sacrifices made in those two earlier conflicts. 
that really allowed the Allies to learn enough to uh, do a credible job when they hit uh, the beaches in Normandy. I have to just say one thing. The, uh, I, <laughs> the, my dad was one of the first of the replacement soldiers that went over and those replacement soldiers were incredibly well trained before they were shipped out. Um, it was roughly what? He was inducted in March of 40, uh, well, it was about six months of training. So um, anyway, I, that's it. <laughs> Anyone else? Let us remember to hold in our hearts the joys and sorrows of the whole company of humanity, whether they are spoken and shared or silent and solitary. Amen. Now let us join in the spirit of prayer or meditation. Gracious God, God of many names and beyond naming, God of our ancestors and of our descendants, we come to you humbly this morning. We need your support. We need your wisdom. We need your courage. We need your inspiration. We need your love. We've always believed that we live in a democracy, an imperfect democracy, but a nation gradually and unevenly becoming more democratic. But now we are worried. Democracy here seems less secure. Democracy here feels threatened. We understand that it is not your role to solve our problems for us, that we got ourselves into this, and it is for us to get back on course. But we need to feel that you are beside us like a friend, that you are behind us, pushing us forward, that you are ahead of us, showing us the way. We long for the day when we will have become a beloved community. When our nation can be known as the realm of God, when justice will roll down like waters, in righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Amen. Now let us pause in silence. And after a minute of silence, Charlie will play hymn 83, Winds Be Still. three readings for you tomorrow. Uh, no, right now, not tomorrow. First is by E.J. Graff, What is Marriage For? Often when I tell people I'm writing a book called What is Marriage For? They answer, toaster ovens and silverware are getting dental benefits. Well, they may be joking, but also correct. Marriage has always been a key way of organizing a society's economy. Without the marriage exchange, most traditional economies cease to turn. Or to put it more bluntly, marriage is always about money. Marriage for love has traditionally been assumed to be the dubious privilege of those without property. For thousands of years, the marriage bargain your parents made for you was more comparable to today's college education in today's marriages. For most of history, the phrase, a good marriage, meant something more like the phrase, a good education or a good job, than the shimmering rainbow of emotions that, that phrase implies today. 
if your life's income was based on your marriage, you wouldn't be so foolish as to marry only because you fell in love any more than you'd hire a business partner based only on sexual infatuation. All this sounds abominably mercenary and soulless now, so much so that we may feel smugly superior to this prostitution of something so sacred and personal as one's life partner. Today, your financial future is no longer so completely determined by how you marry. That fact, which we take for granted, has been a social earthquake that over several centuries has shuddered deeply into the foundations of marriage, transforming it into the institution we know today. Precisely because we can each make our own living, with or without our families of origin, with or without a spouse, we have vastly more choice in matters of the heart. It's no coincidence that a world in which one's financial prospects have become dramatically unmoored from one's marriage prospects, in which how you make your living is separate from where you make your bed. It's a world whose marriages much more easily unravel. The next by Stephanie Kuntz, Too Close for Comfort. It's only been in the last century that Americans have put all their emotional eggs in the basket of coupled love. Because of this change, many of us have found joys in marriage our great-great-grandparents never did. But we've also neglected our other relationships, placing too much burdens on a fragile institution, and making social life poorer in the process. We Americans have reported a marked decline in the number of people with whom we discuss meaningful matters. We have fewer close relationships with co-workers, extended family members, neighbors, and friends. Marriage is the only close relationship where we are more likely to, to discuss important matters now than we were 20 years ago. The solution to this isolation is not to ramp up our emotional dependence on marriage. Until 100 years ago, most societies agreed that it was dangerously antisocial even pathologically self-absorbed to elevate marital affection and nuclear family ties above commitments to neighbors, extended kin, civic duty, and religion. Men and women with confidants beyond the nuclear family are mentally and physically healthier than people who rely on just one other individual for emotional intimacy and support. Paradoxically, we can strengthen our marriages the most by not expecting them to be our sole refuge from the pressures of the modern workforce. Instead, we need to restructure both work and social life so we can reach out and build ties with others, including people who are single or divorced. That indeed would be a return to marital tradition, not the 1950s model, but the pre 20th century model that has a much more enduring pedigree. The final reading is by Jane Brody. That loving feeling takes a lot of work, she writes. When people fall in love and decide to marry, the expectation is nearly always that love and marriage and the happiness they bring will last, as the vows say, till death do us part. Only the most cynical among us would think, walking down the aisle, that if things don't work out, we can always split. But the divorce rate in the United States is half the marriage rate. And that does not bode well for this cherished institution. While some divorces are clearly justified by physical or emotional abuse, in intolerable infidelity, addictive behavior, or irreconcilable in incompatibility, many severed marriages seem to have just withered and died from a lack of effort to keep the embers of love alive. I say embers because the flame of love does not last very long. The passion ignited by a new love inevitably cools. It must mature into the caring, compassion, and companionship that can sustain a long lasting relationship. The, the happiness boost that occurs with marriage lasts only about two years, after which people revert to their former levels of happiness or unhappiness. Infatuation and passion have even shorter lifespans it must evolve into the love of companionship, composed more of deep affection, connection, and liking. 
a natural human tendency to become habituated to positive circumstances, get so used to things that they make us feel good that they no longer do, can be the death knell of marital happiness. Thus, we need to adopt measures to avert or at least slow down the habituation that can lead to boredom and marital dissatisfaction, such as, for example, making time to be together and talk, truly listening to each other, and expressing admiration and affection. Or, or ask yourself each morning, what can I do for five minutes today to make my partner's life better? The simplest acts like sharing an amusing event, smiling, and being playful can enhance marital happiness. Now, Carly, if you could play for us hymn number one, May Nothing Evil Cross This Door, number one. Back in 1973, a young Washington lawyer was interviewed for a magazine article on bachelors. He lived in a commune with several other single young adult anti-war activists. And as it turned out, he was the token hippie in the article. During the interview, the writer asked him how he felt about marriage. He responded with casual indifference. If the right person comes along, fine. But if that doesn't happen, life as a single person is just fine too. Well, he lied. He very much wanted to find someone and get married just the way his parents and their parents had. Indeed, within a year, he was married. Marriage is a strange institution. Is it a religious institution? Is it a legal governmental institution? Is it an economic institution? Or is it some strange hybrid? Should we seek guidance with respect to marriage from lawyers, from clergy persons, from business planners, or from psychotherapists? Is the institution of marriage in decline? As same-sex marriage becomes more and more accepted, many people don't seem to think that marriage is necessary anymore. Old folks care off, but don't bother with formalities. Marriage indeed is a strange institution. I do not claim to be an expert on it. And even if I were, there's no way in the next 15 minutes I could say anything definitive about it. June is the traditional month for, for weddings. I've had a June wedding myself, but I thought it would be appropriate, an appropriate topic for this morning. I fear that my title for this sermon, Till Death Do Us Part, that my title could cause pain to some of us. Perhaps it has caused pain to some who choose to stay away this morning, till death do us part. That's part of the language of the traditional wedding ceremony. But to many of us, it's a source of discomfort. It's a rebuke. We committed for life, then we quit. We broke our promise. In the real world, many marriages fail. Some should be terminated. People should be able to escape from bad marriages without feeling guilt, at least without feeling guilt forever after. Really, the very topic of marriage is painful for many, for those who would like to be married but haven't found the right marriage partner, painful for those whose spouse is no longer with them. If you are sad this morning, I cannot make it better for you, but I can give you the good news that you are in the right place in the midst of a loving, supportive, religious community. Many couples have church weddings. I've had two myself. So you might expect marriage to have its historical foundation in the Bible. Of course, whole books have been written on this, but I'll try to summarize the Bible and marriage in about 30 seconds. Let's look at first at the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. The emphasis here is on procreation. A small nation living in an area of hostile climate Surrounded by unfriendly neighbors, Israel needed offspring. Polygamy was accepted 
The men who could afford it had children with concubines too. Marriage, as the reading from E.J. Graff's book suggests, was a commercial transaction. And you might expect men were in charge, women were second class citizens. Jesus, the Apostle Paul, and the New Testament writers generally bring some new features to this picture. First, a monogamous marriage is the implicit ideal. Polygamy is passé. Without much effort, you can find support for the idea of the equal status of the marriage partners. But secondly, marriage is, itself is no longer the universal norm. Jesus and almost all his disciples are presented as though they were bachelors. It seems unlikely that they were. Paul tells us that he is single, and you can find in the teachings both Jesus and Paul support for celibacy. This quick sketch obviously doesn't do justice to the rich complexity of the Bible, the subject of marriage. I'll leave further exploration to you. If you look at marriage historically, we'll find by and large, it's more about economics than about love. Married couple become an economic unit with a division of labor between them. We look at marriage through the ages, we find as well that it's about transfer of authority. The father of the bride transfers his authority over her to the bridegroom. Some wedding ceremonies still retain the anachronistic ritual of the father giving away the bride. Some ceremonies still call upon the bride to obey her husband. The ideal we have of a young couple falling in love and eventually getting married does not represent the historical norm. More common around the world is the arranged marriage. According to an author I heard interviewed on NPR a few years ago, 60% of marriages worldwide are arranged. Here's the interesting part. Love between the couple starts out lower in the arranged marriage than in what we think of as the standard marriage. But give it time. Five years out, and the love in arranged marriages exceeds that in non-arranged marriages. How do I, as a now permanently married Unitarian Universalist, view marriage? The short answer is that marriage is a human institution. But secondly, it is more than a human institution. Let's explore what those two assertions mean. Marriage is a human institution. I'll make seven points here, one for each day of the week. Marriage is a human institution. That means, first of all, that it is a changing institution. Already alluded to some of the ways that marriage has changed. Not too long ago, same-sex marriage was an unfamiliar concept. Indeed, a contradictory concept a generation ago. The role of economics has gradually diminished. The role of love has increased. I don't think we can expect marriage to reach some ideal state and then stop changing. For that matter, marriage as an institution could be superseded or transformed into something quite different. If, for example, the human lifespan were to well, double to 150, 170 years, what would marriage look like? We have no way of knowing. Second, marriage is an imperfect, fallible institution. Those participating in it are themselves imperfect and fallible. That's the nature of humanity, of the people I know. We have the ideal of marriages that last till death do us part, but we know that despite our best efforts, it doesn't always work out that way. And in the perfect world, marriages would not be terminated by death until both partners have reached a ripe old age. Third, since marriage, marriage is a human institution's it is governed by human values and principles. Thus, in my view, the human institution of marriage should be grounded on the principles of equality and democracy. The two spouses should be equals. The life partners should share decision-making. Fourth, since marriages are not created by God, we cannot expect each of us as one perfect soulmate. If you're single, there's no one ideal spouse just waiting for you, if the two of you can ever find each other. We must work to find, we must work to find a possibly right person, work hard for that person to become a couple that can make a good marriage. And then after the wedding, that couple must continue to work to make the marriage successful and lasting. 
it's not easy. We can never say that we've finished the hard work. We can never say that it's up to the other person. Arranged marriages succeed because those participating in them realize that there's work to be done. It's just as true, perhaps less obvious, in non-arranged marriages. Fifth, since marriages are not created by God, and since we therefore cannot expect to find that one perfect soul man, it follows that there are others out there whom we would find just as attractive and desirable as the one we have now. In a book called The Paradox of Choice, Why More is Less, let's happen to have it here. Psychologist Barry Schwartz advises us, make your decisions non-reversible. Don't try to make the absolute best choice, Schwartz says. Don't try to maximize your choice, but be content with a choice that is good enough. Trying to make the best possible choice is very time consuming, and you probably won't succeed anymore. Worse yet, you'll be afflicted with buyer's remorse. You'll be sure that some other not yet discovered choice would be better. Avoid all of this, short devices. Make a choice that's good enough, and then don't look back. I think the power of non-reversible decisions comes most clearly, this is short writing, comes most clearly when we think about our most important choices. A friend once told me his, how his minister had shocked the congregation with a sermon on marriage in which he said flatly that, yes, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. What he meant was that inevitably you will encounter people who are younger, better looking, funnier, smarter, or seemingly more understanding and empathetic than your wife or husband. But finding a life partner is not a matter of comparison, shopping, and trading up. The only way to find happiness and stability in the presence of seemingly attractive and tempting options is to say, I'm simply not going there. I've made my decision about a life partner, so this person's empathy or that person's looks will have nothing to do with me. I'm not in the market. End of story. Agonizing over whether your love is the real thing or whether your sexual relationship is above or below par, and wondering whether you could have done better is a prescription for misery. Knowing that you've made a choice that you will not reverse allows you to pour your energy into improving the relationship that you have rather than in constantly second guessing it. That's the end of the long quote. Individualism is a theme in American history theme amply reflected in our Unitarian Universalist history and principles. But here's the sixth point. In marriage, we must compromise our individualism. Here's how Anderson and Fight put it in their book, Becoming Married. The central danger of radical individualism is that it seems to support only those commitments to others that are based on personal interest. The, the idea of marriage as a lifelong commitment does not fit easily with this emphasis on the individual as an unburdened self. For the survival of marriages, we need to keep a balance between respecting the needs of the individual and strengthening the social bonds of marriage. Seventh, this is the last point. Since marriage is a human institution, we are responsible, we human beings. As individuals and couples, we're responsible for our own marriages. As parents, friends, citizens, and voters were responsible for maintaining the institution of marriage. We cannot take it for granted. We cannot leave it up to someone else. I said earlier that I look at marriage not only as a human institution, but also as something that's more than human institution, something that in some sense is beyond humanity. Here's what I have in mind. Marriage is governed by the laws of Pennsylvania or Maryland or Arkansas or somewhere. State legislatures enact laws, courts decide cases and interpret the laws. But a marriage agreement isn't like a contract for the sale of six tons of scrap iron with the installation of aluminum siding. I consider my marriage holy. Marriage is a sacred, holy, mystical, spiritual institution. At a wedding, the participants do not simply create a contract, but a covenant. 
What's the difference between a contract and a covenant? It's, it's how we look at it. In law school, I spent a year studying contract law. Most of my fellow students spent another year studying commercial transactions. Covenants involve a higher order of magnitude, of trust and commitment. With contracts, we have to make careful provision for lack of fulfillment, the parties changing their mind. With covenants, we're in it for keeps. Here's what Lester and Lester say about covenants. Covenants are promises that are freely given out of a sense of love and commitment. Covenants are not so much an expectation or demand, but a gift to the other. The concept of covenant has a long history within the Judeo-Christian tradition in describing mutual commitments between two parties who have pledged their faithfulness, not only to the specific agreements, but to the relationship. Contracts can be made between any two persons. The covenants are made between two persons who are committed to love and care of one another. Covenants reflect trust already established between persons who are in a significant relationship. Contracts are, are of necessity legalistic and rigid, but covenants are dynamic and fluid. They can be adapted to changing circumstances. Couples find that covenants must be continuously renegotiated to stay current with their life situation. When covenants aren't kept, we will probably feel hurt and angry. But keep this in mind too. When a covenant is broken, we can express mercy and forgiveness. I don't remember when I first heard of the idea of same-sex marriage. But I know it was more than 40 years ago. I remember well my reaction. No, it doesn't make sense. Marriage, by definition, is between a man and a woman. Otherwise, you can't call it marriage. It was an, an emotional response. It was a conservative response. This is the way the world is, my gut told me. We could no more have alter this fundamental feature, this defining characteristics of marriage, than you could, say, challenge General Motors or add to Mount Rushmore. That's often the way it is with unfamiliar ideas. We almost instinctively oppose them. Then we hear about something a second, a third, a fourth time. Of course, some ideas never get better, but some ideas improve with age, with familiarity. Some ideas get their feet far enough in the door that we start thinking about them. What's marriage about anyway? Why should it be restricted to people of opposite sex? Every week, the New York Times has stories about notable weddings. One Sunday, the Times had a story about the wedding of a cousin of mine, Corby. Corby and John have already celebrated their 16th anniversary. And it was only 50 years ago that the Supreme Court gave its blessing to interracial marriage, lifting the ban that many states had imposed. And now I now have among my many cousins, those participating in same-sex marriages and those participating in interracial marriages. May the institution of marriage had long flourish, and it always remain open to change, and that change move it toward the unreachable part of perfection. Amen. And now, Carly, if you could play our closing hymn, it's number six, Just As Long As I Have Breath, number six. It is time to extinguish the challenge, this challenge flame. Extinguish this flame, but not the gift of wisdom, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and in our hands until we are together again. For all who seek God, may God abide in you. For all who seek understanding, may you never be satisfied. For all who seek love, 
May you always have enough to share. Amen. And now maybe someone will tell us more about our coffee hour today. Miranda? Hi, I was busy finding 